Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, what is Gestalt therapy and what are my opinions about Gestalt therapy? This is a question that was submitted by a subscriber and I appreciate the interest in Gestalt therapy and in my opinions. I'll give a summary of Gestalt therapy first and I'll go through and kind of give my take on Gestalt therapy. So originally Gestalt therapy was created by a theorist named Fritz Perls and he took components of other therapies and merged them together and then added his own creativity. So Gestalt therapy is actually a bit unusual compared to a lot of other theoretical modalities. I wouldn't consider Gestalt therapy by any means to be obscure. There are many people that practice it, but I wouldn't exactly call it mainstream either. It kind of sits in the middle. It's certainly not as established with empirical support like cognitive behavioral therapy, but there are, like I said, a number of people that practice it, and it's very common for individuals to integrate Gestalt therapy techniques into their therapeutic practice. So let's take a quick look at Gestalt therapy. There are actually a lot of aspects to the original Gestalt therapy as developed by Fritz Perls. I'm just gonna summarize here. A major part of Gestalt therapy is awareness. Pearls believed that one of the reasons individuals developed mental health symptoms was because they weren't aware of their senses, emotions, they didn't have good recognition of their bodily sensations, and they had poor awareness of their environment. He also believed there were problems referred to as contact boundaries, so problems that people had interacting with their environment and with other people, and that these contact boundaries could be problematic. He also believed in what he referred to as the five layers of neuroses, phony, phobic, impasse, implosive, and explosive. And he believed that through Gestalt therapy, through the application of all these various techniques, these layers could be stripped away. And that these layers did have to be removed for somebody to become authentic. So at the phony layer of neuroses, someone is inauthentic. Their reactions are inauthentic. At the phobic level, they're avoiding pain. At the impasse level, they're afraid to change. At the implosive level, their awareness is increased, but they're not ready to take action. And then at the explosive level, they are authentic. So really, that's the goal in Gestalt therapy, is to reach that explosive level and be fully alive, as Fritz Perls put it. So other than the lack of awareness that I was just talking about with Gestalt therapy, Perls had a number of other possible causes to mental health symptoms. And the two major ones would be unfinished business, meaning if feelings are unexpressed, that leads to mental health symptoms, and not taking responsibility. So when you take unfinished business, not taking responsibility, and not being aware, a lack of awareness, those three things represent a large part of the problem as conceptualized in Gestalt therapy. So to address these conditions or situations and to realize improvement, Pearls developed a number of techniques. Confrontation is probably one of the techniques we hear about the most because it was really the most unusual. It was kind of a harsh and almost a little bit aggressive therapeutic way of being. It was an unusual way to kind of sit with a client compared to say person-centered therapy or existential therapy. So this would be when something comes up that the therapist believes requires confrontation, when some sort of change is apparent but the person can't quite get there, the Gestalt therapist would be confrontational. They could be a little bit abrasive. This isn't really used much anymore in Gestalt therapy, but this was a key technique in the early days of Gestalt therapy. Another technique, and we do see this one now, is to keep everything, if at all possible, in the present. So Gestalt therapy is interested in the here and now, to the extent that if there is something in the past that people are bringing into the session, which of course oftentimes there is, the Gestalt therapist makes an effort to have that past experience acted out in the present. 
almost in a sense, whatever the problem was in the past, the Gestalt therapist is trying to make it the problem now, the theory being that if it's the problem now, it can be dealt with. If it's current, it can be dealt with. And if it's in the past, it can't really be resolved. Now this gets a little bit abstract and philosophical, but this is a key part of Gestalt therapy. This is a technique. And this technique is used quite a bit now, as I mentioned. Another technique is to enhance awareness. And really this is an overarching technique, and there are a lot of techniques underneath of this. So there are a lot of different ways that a Gestalt therapist helps to enhance awareness. This could be through pointing out nonverbal behavior. For example, somebody could be looking down at the floor a lot and they don't realize they're doing it, and a Gestalt therapist will point that out. Also, that kind of goes hand in hand with the confrontational piece, but it's really to enhance awareness. Another way to enhance awareness is through the use of language. So, for example, Gestalt therapists usually believe that the more a client uses the word I, the more their awareness will increase. So instead of referring to a problem in terms of something external, like it's causing me not to have hope, a Gestalt therapist would encourage somebody to say, I'm causing myself not to have hope. So it's a personal responsibility piece, but also identifying in the first person with situations and conditions. Taking responsibility is a part of it, but just even using the language is another part of it. Whether or not this works, I mean, again, a lot of these techniques are somewhat controversial, but that is part of what we see in Gestalt therapy. Another aspect we see in Gestalt therapy is role playing. So this is when a Gestalt therapist asks a client to act like somebody else. So let's say that a client has a contentious relationship with their sister. So they may be asked to play the role of their sister. And they could do this for 5, 10, 15 minutes and maintain that role in session. Another technique we see is enactment. And this one, again, is even more controversial than the usual controversial level we see with a lot of Gestalt therapy techniques. This is when a client is asked to act out something that they indicated in the session. For example, if the client says, right now I feel like a child who's having a temper tantrum, the Gestalt therapist may say, well, act like a child who's having a temper tantrum. Throw a temper tantrum right now. And again, this could last for several minutes, and it would be animated. It's not something that would just be verbal, where they say the words that a child who's throwing a temper tantrum would say, but also the physical movements would be included. The last technique I'll cover here is really probably the most easily recognizable, the technique that's most associated with Gestalt therapy, and that's the self-dialogue. And it comes in various forms, but the most popular form is the empty chair technique. We also see another version that's fairly popular, which is the two chair technique. So the empty chair technique, an individual is asked to have a conversation with an empty chair but they're supposed to imagine a person in that chair. Usually, of course, a person that would have some connection to why they're there in therapy. So let's say an individual was abused by a friend of theirs when they were a child. Their friend, in their imagination, their friend would be in that chair and they would have a discussion with them. Now with the two-chair technique, it's a little different. With two-chair technique, we see the client in one chair and an empty chair across from them, just like the empty chair technique. But in two chair, the individual plays both sides. So they act as themselves for one side of the conversation, and then when it's the other person's chance to talk, they physically get out of the chair they're in and move to the other chair and talk to themselves. Now there's also another version of this where the client divides themselves into parts. We see this both with empty chair and two chair. So you may have the angry part of someone talking to the happy part of the same person. Or for example, with empty chair, you could have the client as themselves talking to the angry part of themselves. So we see this self-dialogue as a fairly popular technique, as I mentioned with Gestalt therapy. 
And a lot of times, even practitioners that don't use Gestalt therapy or use a number of the techniques will still use this self-dialogue technique. So for the second part of the question, what's my opinion of Gestalt therapy? Gestalt therapy is an interesting therapy, and I have mixed feelings about it. As a scientist, of course, I'm always looking for the truth. And sometimes when we find the truth out about a therapy, we're happy about that, and sometimes we're not as happy. To understand Gestalt therapy, though, it's first important to understand that there's really two types of Gestalt therapy. There's the Gestalt therapy that Fritz Perls invented, and it had his kind of creative flair to it and his personality infused in it. And then there's the Gestalt therapy that's used today. There's really not a lot of empirical evidence supporting the Gestalt therapy used by Fritz Perls, the Gestalt therapy that he invented. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of empirical evidence to support Gestalt therapy now. However, it's really important to understand the differentiation between a theory and techniques. So Gestalt therapy is a little strange in this sense. There's not much support for the theory of Gestalt therapy, and there's a few reasons for this, but there is actually quite a bit of support for the techniques. For example, the self-dialogue, the empty chair and the two chair. So for many of the techniques, scientific evidence suggests that those techniques work but the overarching theory doesn't really have a lot of support. Now, one of the main reasons for this is because even though there are a lot of places that teach Gestalt therapy, a lot of institutes, for example, there is no standard format. There is no central theoretical orientation associated with Gestalt therapy. It's fragmented. So really, whether it works or not, we don't know because we can't test it. We can't test one standard format of Gestalt therapy. Now, all theoretical modalities have variations. If you learn about CBT at one place and then you drive across the country and you learn about somewhere else, there's going to be differences. But overall, there's much more agreement inside a lot of the other theoretical modalities, like cognitive behavioral therapy, than there is in Gestalt therapy. I think that someone could effectively argue that because the Gestalt therapy techniques are generally effective. That if a coherent theoretical model for Gestalt therapy could be brought together, it's likely that it would be effective. It's likely that research would support it. However, because there is no coherent theoretical model, we can't conduct that research and we don't know. And when we talk about science and the way science works, we just can't make that assumption. We just can't say, well, because the techniques do seem to work, if we could put these techniques together, then those techniques would work together. They might or they might not. I think what is supported is the idea that the Gestalt techniques could be infused in other theoretical modalities. For example, somebody could use Adlerian therapy, psychodynamic therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, reality therapy, and use Gestalt therapy techniques as a part of delivering the treatments and the techniques seen in a other theoretical modality. And a lot of clinicians do this. A lot of clinicians combine multiple theoretical modalities and parts of other modalities. So research supports that the techniques could be used in other modalities, but we don't have a set of guidelines to pull all the Gestalt techniques together and use them and really call it Gestalt therapy. So what's my opinion about Gestalt therapy? Well, overall, I like it, but I wish that we could get one model of Gestalt therapy so that it could be tested. I do believe that overall it is creative. I like the creative element of it. I like how it uses techniques that are a little different than what we see in traditional therapy. Certainly a number of clients who are treated with Gestalt therapy report that it's engaging and it can even be fun. And typically we don't think of therapy as primarily being fun. So I really like those aspects of Gestalt therapy. I like that it's engaging. I like that it can be fun. I like that it really makes people think in ways that they might not think. It really pushes people a little bit outside the comfort zone. But it does need to have some work with the model being standardized. That's important. 
for Gestalt therapy to really survive and continue as a theoretical modality, it has to be organized. So overall, I like it, but I have some concerns and I'm still a little skeptical in terms of whether it would work if it was put together as a theory. I hope you found this description of Gestalt therapy and my opinions about Gestalt therapy to be interesting. Thanks for watching.